Hello everybody, so today we're going to be discussing a an interesting topic which is mentioned in the title of the video and it's inspired by uh, a previous video that I did last week where I said that the fact that women were oppressed based on their ability to get pregnant is one of the main reasons why it would make sense to define women nowadays with reference to their ability to get pregnant. So basically the fact that women were oppressed often with direct reference to the reality of their biological female sex is one of the reasons why it makes sense now to continue to understand women with reference to biological reality. But this did lead to somebody responding. They said, uh, and you know, I'm gonna quote them directly, but this video is not really a direct response to them by any means. It's just a, an interesting objection and therefore I thought it was worth uh, being the topic of a video. You've defined woman by biology because they were oppressed by their biology. Why should we define women by their oppression? Is that not saying to be a woman is to be oppressed? So there you go. Quite simply, is it objectionable to say uh, or define women with reference to uh, their attributes by which they were oppressed in the past, and attributes that to some extent formed the reality of their oppression historically. Now, there is an obvious point that needs to be made, which is that when it comes to defining words in general, one thing that really matters is how that word has been historically understood. Now, this doesn't mean that this would be the only consideration and we can never change words. Uh, obviously, there's going to be other, th other things to consider. And if, for example, a way of defining a, a word is uh, particularly morally objectionable or maybe even kind of incoherent and, you know, internally inconsistent, we might want to redefine words. But actually, that a word has just been used that way in the past is one of the go-to reasons why we would continue to, to define a word that way. So for example, uh, you know, if you said, why should we define glass as being a, a clear material that you can shape into things, you know, use for lots of kind of, you know, make, making things and industrial purposes. And one of the simplest reasons would just be, well, because that's the way we've always used the term. There's no point changing the way we use the term to suddenly mean something else. So that's pretty obvious. And of course, it applies to identities as well. So a really interesting example of this is uh, can be found in the phrase, uh, race is real, in that its effects are real. So basically, race isn't really real. Uh, or rather, the fact that we would say people belong to particular races is entirely arbitrary. You know, we decide that uh, black people are a different race and oriental kind of East Asian people are a different race and all that kind of stuff. But we could draw the lines anywhere. And in the past, we have drawn the lines in many different places. So the reality is that obviously you can say, well, anybody, anybody belongs to this particular race or anybody belongs to that particular race. And there's no objective standard for it. So ultimately, you'll notice that uh, the only standard there really is, is precedent. And obviously, therefore, that's where we get the phrase race is real and that its effects are real. Race is real in that as soon as we start, or as soon as we invented this category of race, as soon as we started saying, well, that person's black and that person's white and that person's whatever else, as soon as we started doing that, at that point, and especially as soon as we started organizing society to any extent around those distinctions, at that point, it immediately mattered that we could say who is black and who is white. Uh, and of course, all the other races as well, but I'm just going to say black and white to keep it simple. So the fact that we had, for example, the civil rights movement in the United States to combat racial inequality uh, meant, you know, of course, that there was no reason why we needed to understand people from Africa and, you know, originally from Africa and people originally from Europe as these two separate groups. There was no reason that needed to be the case. No fundamental thing in our, in our DNA or something like that that said we needed to divide ourselves like that. 
But we did divide ourselves like that. And as soon as we did that, suddenly it mattered that we could accurately describe that division so that when we were doing things like the civil rights movement, we could say whose rights it is that, uh, you know, was actually being fought for. And the fact that I'm mentioning the civil rights movement is key because uh, race and the kind of invention of race was quite universally tied to the existence of racism as a system of oppression. So if we want to, particularly within the context of the United States, where I think the systemic oppression of black people was undeniable, uh, if we wanted to define black people in a way that makes sense, we would have to define them with reference to them being understood as black people within a system of racist oppression, aka we would have to define them as black people with reference to the reality of their oppression and how that oppression was understood by those doing the oppress oppressing, and ultimately based on the fact that we need to use historical precedent when thinking about how it makes sense to define words, uh, we do need to look at how did racists and systems of racist oppression understand and categorize who is a black person. And of course, this applies to other things too, like uh, sexuality. You know, that again, you could say sexuality is somewhat arbitrary. I mean, we're just attracted to other people and there's not necessarily any intrinsic reason why we need to group together individuals based on who they're attracted to or come up with these categorizations. We could just say, well, I'm a human being. I'm attracted to other human beings. Uh, and indeed, there are societies, for example, where ultimately the idea of were you attracted to biological males or biological females didn't necessarily matter very much. And it wasn't something they were that interested in describing. But of course, when people did start to identify sexualities, it was often with the expressed purpose of categorizing those other sexualities as deviant. And obviously, for example, if you want to do, let's say that, uh, you know, as uh, homosexuality became something that was punishable in Europe, for example, uh, what you would have seen is people defining what it means for somebody to be gay as two biological males having sex. So that was, that definition extends from oppression. You know, it extends from the fact that people needed to be able to say, well, these people are homosexual or whatever other language they would have used so that they could actually uh, cast judgment on that sexuality. And therefore, it would be, in, you know, nowadays we know, therefore, that it would be inappropriate for me to say that I'm gay or I'm, you know, homosexual or whatever else because uh, I'm straight. You know, I that sexuality by which uh, gay people were, you know, stoned and hanged in the past is a sexuality that is not mirrored in my own sexual preferences. If all of the people who are homophobic understood what the literal reality of homosexuality was when they were oppressing people for being gay, uh, then ultimately that's that has to be something that informs how we understand being gay in you know modern society. And for example, I mean, if um, you know we had a different kind of system of like sexuality where, for example, I mean, as the Romans did, for example, where it was more like whether or not you're the passive or active partner. Well. In that context, obviously, for example, being the passive partner was generally viewed as the sort of negative and more kind of a stigmatized role. And in that case, it's possible that some people who might be defined correctly as heterosexual and in kind of the, the majority group now would be defined as a passive partner and therefore in the minority group if things are played out differently. So actually, yeah, when we're using these terms and defining these terms, we're seeking to uh, understand contemporary society with reference to, again, systems of oppression that have existed in the past. And ultimately, at its basic kind of level, if people were oppressed for a thing, then it must be true that that particular demographic is described by that thing. You know, if women were oppressed because they could get pregnant, 
then it has to be true to say that women get pregnant. If, uh, by a lot of, for example, uh, gay people were oppressed because they were males having sex with males, there were men having sex with men, then it must be true that that's what it means to be gay. You know, if you look, for example, at uh, the um, uh, Inquisition, if Protestants were oppressed for, uh, you know, believing in faith alone, then it must be true, or, you know, I mean, you could say anything else, like objecting the uh, supremacy and the authority of the Pope. Then one of the things that must make somebody a Protestant is rejecting the authority and supremacy of the Pope. You know, if people are being oppressed because of a particular attribute of theirs, it must be true that they possess that particular attribute, uh, which yeah, is a pretty obvious point. And this applies to women, of course. You know, women were understood as being biologically female. And therefore, when misogynistic and patriarchal structures emerged, they had to know well, you know, who is the underclass? Who is the group that is going to be being oppressed? Obviously, it wasn't, you know, I'm not suggesting that any group of people sat down and worked all of this stuff out, uh, you know, by committee or something like that. But this is something that kind of evolved over time, of course. But uh, who was the group who was going to be oppressed? And they had to be able to point to an actual group just like other systems of oppression, it had to be something they're pointing to. And the reality is they were pointing to uh, being biologically female. And indeed, uh, many works of literature that deal with the history of women's oppression and the uh, kind of establishment of patriarchy make very explicit reference to the fact that it was women's biological uh, sex that was uh, a big part of how they came to be defined and understood as a group and a demographic and uh, understood as a demographic that was inferior to men. And when the system of gender emerged, which basically said, you know, you have femininity and masculinity, which of course argued that uh, women were, uh, you know, there was something more to being a woman beyond biological reality, that women were supposed to be feminine, passive, all that kind of stuff. Again, the way that system worked was building on being biologically female and saying, well, these people who are biologically female are the people who are expected to be feminine. So again, it was uh, the all of the systems of oppression that relate to women relate to the reality of them being biologically female. So when we say, who is a woman, we have to look at who was being treated as a woman. And also, yeah, how did this idea of woman emerge? What was the initial referent for somebody being a woman? And, you know, obviously, even today, patriarchy and misogyny are still very relevant things. And it doesn't make sense to have understood these things as fundamentally changing in terms of systems of oppression. They're still the same basic systems of oppression, and therefore... If that oppression was uh, applied to women based on the reality of them being able to get pregnant and you know their kind of uh, capacity for reproduction in the past, then we it would make sense to understand women as a category as continuous with that form of oppression that existed in the past. Now, I need to get to the obvious point, of course, which is that uh, you know somebody said, or the, the specific comment was, you know, isn't this defining women? as oppressed, isn't it saying that to be a woman is to be oppressed? Uh, and of course, that's not true. And indeed, uh, in the video which was uploaded today, as it happens, but um, obviously, as you're watching this, it won't be today. But as I'm recording this, it's today. I made a very specific point of saying that you shouldn't say that what it means to be a woman is to be oppressed. You know, uh, that that should be entirely how you understand yourself as a woman. Because, of course, actually what it means to be a woman is pretty, pretty simple and pretty objective. It's just being biologically female. So, you know, that, that is what makes you a woman. And therefore, what we would want is to make it so being biologically female is not a source of oppression. So we're not saying that women need to be defined with reference to being oppressed. 
we're saying we need to be able to look at how did this category of women come about? And we recognize the relevance of patriarchy and misogyny, and of course, systemic oppression to that. And then we say, well, who were women? We recognize they were biologically female. And then we say, okay, so now we have this category of women and we know who they are, they're biologically female. Let's elevate them so they're no longer being oppressed. And of course, this is uh, really the main point of the video I want to get at, get at, and I want you to maybe take away from this if you take anything away from this video, which is that when we understand groups with reference to the legacy of their oppression, and you know, demographics with reference to the reality of their historic oppression, it is the only way that we can guarantee that that oppression has stopped. So, for example, if we just redefined women to have nothing to do with the history of women's oppression, then how would we know that oppression has stopped? Because you look at, for example, women's oppression, what was it based on? It was based on the reality of them being biologically female. So, uh, you know, that, that's obvious. So what if we just said, okay, let's redefine women. So instead, it just means, you know, whatever. Anybody, I mean, heck, we could just go, go to the actual example provided by TRAs of, it just means anybody who identifies as a woman. Well, the problem with that is that now we might then ask the question, are women still oppressed? You know, is the oppression of women still a problem? And what we would do is we would look to the oppression of women in the past and we say, well, they were certainly oppressed then. And then we might look to the oppression of women currently and we say, actually, you know what? Maybe they're not oppressed. Maybe there is literally no oppression actually happening now. And the problem is, you'll notice, that we've actually changed the definition of woman. So we're not actually answering the question of does the oppression still exist? We're answering the question of is there a group cool, that we call women who is being oppressed? And of course, you know, this is a concern I, I brought up in another video a while ago, which is that uh, it's entirely possible that if we redefine women, so, you know, we no longer have any consideration for the basis upon which women were oppressed in the past, that we could literally make it so that it's no longer accurate to say that women are oppressed because, you know, the term woman has been changed and nobody's using the term woman uh, with reference to being biologically female anymore. And yet still, it could be that the exact same oppression still exists because biological females are still being oppressed for all the same reasons that they previously were. So the best way to guarantee, and of course, yeah, conversely, if we continue to define women with reference to how they've been oppressed historically, then we can know that that oppression has been defeated when women are no longer oppressed. Pretty simple, right? You know, it's very simple. You know, in one situation, we can say, well, are women still oppressed? And actually, aren't asking that question tells us nothing because we've defined women, you know, we've divorced our definition of women from the historical reality of women's oppression. So now we're kind of asking a completely different question when we say, are women still oppressed? Whereas, of course, if you use the gender critical definition and you say, well, let's look at how women were defined historically and how women as a category that is kind of interwoven with the systemic oppressions of the patriarchy came to be defined, let's look at that definition, continue with that definition, and then ask the question, are women still oppressed? And of course, if the answer is no, then we know that the initial oppression of women, the historic oppression of women, the reality of patriarchy has actually been overcome. And of course, going back, this applies to other things too. So uh, if you look at the reality of black people's oppression, if we look at the, the history of uh, the oppression of black people in the United States, we say, well, who were the people who were being oppressed? Oh, it was the people who with uh, ancestry, you know, immediate ancestry from sub-Saharan Africa, who were kind of had a dark skin pigmentation, uh, those were the people who were oppressed. But if we redefined being black to mean anybody who's left-handed, for example, we might then say, well, are black people oppressed? And we'd look and we'd say, well, there's no real oppression of left-handed people. So I guess the oppression's gone. But if people who have immediate ancestry from sub-Saharan Africa, or, you know, like, you know, relatively immediate, uh, and, and have dark skin pigmentation, are still being oppressed, the oppression hasn't gone. And yet, because we've redefined the term, we don't know that. And of course, you know, you can apply it to being gay as well, or lesbian, you know, we'll use lesbian just to, you know, give that some representation in the kind of analogy. Uh, if we redefined lesbian, 
for example, I don't know, to mean somebody who's really enthusiastic about penises, then we would look to the past where lesbians were oppressed as biological females attracted to other biological females, and then we might look into the present when many lesbians are actually just, you know, spicy straights, uh, and we would say, oh, uh, are lesbians still being oppressed? Is lesbophobia still a massive issue? And if we've redefined lesbian to no longer mean biological females attached to, uh, you know, attracted to other biological females, we could wrongly conclude that the oppression of lesbians has ended when actually the historical oppression of biological females attracted to other biological females is still alive and well. So in conclusion, women aren't defined by their oppression. They're defined by being biologically female. But the reality is that women have been oppressed as women, and as such they have been oppressed as biological females. So it's actually quite simple. All we're doing here is we're not saying women are defined by being oppressed. We're saying women have a definition and patriarchy exists. And if you have those two statements together, women has a definition and patriarchy exists, then you would have to say, well, there must have been a group who were being oppressed under patriarchy, and that group was women. So then you would say, well, which, where was the group that was oppressed? Who were the group that was oppressed? Oh, it was the pregnant people, the people who had babies, the people who, you know, um, uh, breastfed, the people who did all that kind of stuff. It was the people who were biologically female. And we say, okay, we've identified the group. And yes, we've identified the group by looking at the reality of their oppression under patriarchy, but that doesn't mean we're defining them by uh, their oppression under patriarchy. We're just recognizing the subject of patriarchal oppression. And as soon as you recognize that the subject of patriarchal oppression is women, it's entirely legitimate to then say, well, let's look at where patriarchal oppression was directed, and oh, look, it was women. So it's really that simple. Um, I say it's that simple. I mean, obviously, I know, you know, I'm sure there'll be some kind of people who will point out, well, gender norm, gender non-conforming men were also subject to oppression under patriarchy. Uh, obviously, the point is you need to have some appreciation for the fact that um, patriarchy is not simplistic. You know, there is obviously a lot of complexity to patriarchy. But uh, when it comes to recognizing who was the group that was ultimately taking the brunt of patriarchy's um, kind of forces of systemic oppression, that was women and it was biological females, uh, which is to say then that's how we know that women are biological females. So there we go. The question was, you know, does it make sense to define women with reference to the attributes that were observed when women were being oppressed? And I'm comfortable saying uh, that the answer is yes and no, we're not saying that women need to only be understood as oppressed or anything like that. Uh, we're simply recognizing that uh, the oppression of women was a reality of patriarchy and therefore looking towards the victims of uh, patriarchal oppression to say who is a woman. And of course, for example, I would say, as a biological male, I am not and never would have been a victim of patriarchal oppression, or at least not, you know, a, a central victim. Again, obviously, you could say, well, what if I did something gender nonconforming? Then I would be a victim. But obviously, that's... Um, you know, like I say, that that's just a, a complexity that's best say for another video. But you know, if we're just talking in simple terms, we would say that I am not a victim of patriarchal oppression. I would not be a victim of patriarchal oppression, and that is quite simply because I'm biologically male. If I were biologically female instead, yes, I would be a victim of patriarchal oppression. Yes, the abortion ban or the kind of overturning of Roe v. Wade, which basically takes away biological females' agency over their own bodies would be an oppression of me, assuming I was American, of course, in a way that it is not simply based on the reality of my being biologically male. So that's the conclusion to the video. Um, I'm going to interact with the chat in a bit. Uh, I kind of was just ignoring it because I was just like, I'll just power through. So sorry, chat. Uh, oh, by the way, I suppose I'll say this. So uh, Lazio, I'll, I'll give you a shout out, uh, said that there should be a way that I can actually stream simultaneously on Twitch and YouTube, and more than that, if you can imagine, uh, actually uh, make it so that the chat is kind of like an amalgam of YouTube and Twitch. Now, I'm not sure if that's exactly going to work. There's a bit of kind of a learning curve for these kind of things, but hopefully if I can get it to work, I'll probably do a test stream or two before I, you know, commit to it. But you might expect to see a video, you know, if you're somebody who's uh, a bit 
uh, reticent about Twitch because it's like this new thing. And, you know, I mean, certainly I put off starting Twitch streaming for long enough, so I can't blame you. But yeah, if you're someone who's, who doesn't really want to go on Twitch, then maybe that would be an option. Having said that, it, maybe it won't be an option. So the easiest thing to do if you want to be part of, uh, you know, interacting with this stuff is to check out Twitch. For example, after I'm, you know, done with this video, I'm going to be uh, talking about and kind of razzing on uh, the response to the whole Bette Midler thing. You know, Bette Midler recently came out and said some uh, gender critical comments, and I'm going to be kind of just talking about a little bit, reading her comments and laughing at some of the replies. So that's a fun thing, and it's what they call in the business a Twitch exclusive. Now, having said that, if you miss something I do on Twitch, uh, I finally got channels up on the Casey Streams channel. So Casey Streams, it's just a place where I'm, I'm going to archive all of my Twitch stuff. And you can see all the full videos there. I've already got, for example, if you've missed this, uh, a full response to a ContraPoints video, which I've not, I'm not going to upload to this channel. So if you ever thought, wow, I want to see King Critical respond to another ContraPoints video. Well, guess what? If you just engage with this channel, there's going to be at least one and actually probably several more uh, such videos that you will never see. So go do it. Engage with all this stuff. Uh, check out Casey Streams. Check out Twitch if you haven't already. Uh, all the links should be in the comments. And of course, but obviously, you know, I don't want to uh, badmouth YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I was saying that you can still like, share, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff. Uh, let me know what you think. And if you want to help out in doing, you can give on Patreon or you can also give on PayPal. And yeah, I guess I can just say thank you to my current patrons.